I'm Bert Lancaster, back visiting my old hometown, New York City. This is the neighborhood of 187th Street and Arthur Avenue in the Bronx, not far from where I was born. It hasn't changed much. It's still a busy, crowded place of many racial strains, neither rich nor poor. New York is just a huge collection of neighborhoods, people working, worshiping, enjoying their hard-won leisure, or trying to. Recognize that fellow? His name is Marty. Never heard of him, hmm? Well, you will, because we made a picture about him. No, I'm not in it. It's all his. But this is a picture I'm proud to be associated with, and the name of it is Marty. What are you doing New Year's Eve? Nothing. This is the simplest and the most beautiful love story I've ever seen in a movie. Harold Hecht and I produced this picture. Patty Chayefsky wrote it, and Delbert Mann directed it. And talk about stars being born. The performances of Ernie Borgnine and Betsy Blair make me proud to be an actor. And of the picture itself, well, I'm just plain proud. Marty, I want a nice big fat bullet, about four pounds. Sure. I hear your kid brother got married last Sunday. That's right. It was a very nice affair. Marty, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. All your kid brothers and sisters married and got children. When are you going to get married? Hmm? What do you feel like doing tonight? Well, I don't know, Angie. What do you feel like doing? Yeah, tonight. Well, I know it's a little late to call for a date, but I didn't know myself to... Yeah, I know. Yeah, well, what about... Well, how about next Saturday night? I, are you free next Saturday night? Well, what about the Saturday after that? Yeah. Yeah, I know. Well, I mean, I understand that. Yeah. Yeah. Why don't you go to the Stardust Ballroom? What? I, I say, why don't you go to the Stardust Ballroom? It's loaded with tomatoes. Are you going to die without a son? No, I'll die without a son. Oh, Marty, put on the blue suit, huh? Blue suit, gray suit. I'm just a fat little man, a fat, ugly man. You're not ugly. I'm ugly, I'm ugly, I'm ugly. Marty. Ma, leave me alone! Ma, what do you want from me? What do you want from me? I'm miserable enough as it is. All right, so I'll go to the Stardust Ballroom. I'll put on a blue suit and I'll go. And you know what I'm going to get for my trouble? Heartache. A big night of heartache. You know how I figure two people get married and are going to live together 40, 50 years, so it's got to be more than whether they're just good looking or not. And now you tell me you think you're not so good looking. Well, my father was a real ugly man, but my mother adored him. She told me how she used to get so miserable sometimes, like everybody, you know? And she says, my father always tried to understand. Now, I used to see them sometimes when I was a kid, sitting in the living room, talking and talking. And, and I used to adore my old man because he was always so kind. That's one of the most beautiful things I have in my life, the way my father and mother were. I'm 29 years old. How old are you? I'm 34. Marty, I've known you for three hours, but I know you're a good butcher. You're an intelligent, decent, sensitive man, and, well, I, I have a feeling about you. Like, well, like sometimes one of my kids comes in to see me about something or other, and, and some of these kids, Marty, in my classes, they, they have so much warmth and, 
and so much capacity. Well, that's the feeling I have about you. George, what are you doing tonight? What are you doing tonight? I don't know. What are you doing tonight? The burlesque, Louis paradise, miserable and lonely, miserable and lonely and stupid. What am I, crazy or something? I got something good here. What am I hanging around with you guys for? What you? you don't like her. My mother don't like her. She's a dog and I'm a fat, ugly man. Well, all I know is I had a good time last night. I'm going to have a good time tonight. If we have enough good times together, I'm going to get down on my knees. I'm going to beg that girl to marry me. If we make a party on New Year's, I got a date for that party. You don't like her. That's too bad. Hey, Edge. When are you going to get married? Now to present the award for the best picture. Former Academy Award winner, Miss Audrey Hepburn. Hello, Jerry. Hello, Audrey. How are you, darling? <laughs> Very well, thank you. Something nice seeing you again, dear. Jerry. Yes? Before I present the award, I have something for you. For me? I don't figure to get one of them. Well, it's not quite an Oscar, but for your wonderful work tonight, the Board of Governors of the Academy have asked me to give you this. Thank you. And one for me, too. That's, uh, that's very nice, and I certainly appreciate it. I can't wait to get home to see if it fits on the mantle. Nominees for Best Picture of the Year. Love is a Many Splendid Thing, 20th Century Fox, produced by Buddy Adler. Marty, Hecht Lancaster, United Artists, produced by Harold Hecht. Mr. Roberts, Warner Brothers, produced by Leland Hayward. Picnic, Columbia, produced by Fred Colmar. The Rose Tattoo, Hal Wallace, Paramount, Produced by Hal B. Wallace. The winner is... Marty Harold Hepp. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's very fortunate to live in a country where any man, no matter how humble his origin, can become president, and to be part of an industry where any picture, no matter how low its budget, can win the Oscar. <laughs> All of us who worked on Marty are especially fortunate for this great honor. For to us all, from the very beginning, it was a labor of love. Thank you. Congratulations, and thank you, Audrey. The nominees for Best Actor are Ernest Borgnine in Marty, James Cagney in Love Me or Leave Me, James Dean in East of Eden, Frank Sinatra in The Man with the Golden Arm, Spencer Tracy in Bad Day at Black Rock. The winner is Ernest Bordman. Yeah. For the sake of sounding repetitious, I just want to thank my mother for giving me the 
idea of going in and doing this, getting into this wonderful profession. My pop for being steadfast, my lovely wife for helping me. Thank you very, very much. And to the Heck Lancaster organization, I just can't express my thanks. Thank you, one and all. This is Joe Mankiewicz in New York. And now from London on film, a nominee for her performance in Love is a Many Splendid Thing, Miss Jennifer Jones. Everyone in the profession knows what this is. That holy of holies, the director's chair. However, it is rarely used because most directors are too frantically busy to sit down. They have to be, for no film can be successful without the hard work of a talented and understanding director. This year, five gifted directors have been nominated. And now, if someone will please open the envelope, we shall learn which of them is the winner. The directors nominated are Ilya Kazan for East of Eden, Joshua Logan for Picnic, Delbert Mann for Marty, David Lean for Summertime, John Sturgis for Bad Day at Black Rock. And the winner. The winner here in New York is Del Man for Marty. Thank you. Thank you very much. You've heard about performers who can read names out of a phone book and make it sound pretty exciting. Well, in Italy, there's an actress who can read the numbers and make you cry. A talented lady who was a nominee for a gold statue for her performance in The Rose Tattoo on film from Rome, Miss Anna Magnani. You see, we have some statues in Rome, too. This one is the Venere dei Medici in the Campidoglio. It's very beautiful. It's one of our favorite statues. Of course, some of us have uh, other favorite, uh, smaller statues. They are friendly and look so nice around the house. But that is only if one likes statues. <laughs> uh, I'm to say who is the winner for the best screenplay, but the paper says only cut to Hollywood. What is one to do? <laughs> One is to open the envelope, Miss Magnani. The winner in New York, Marty Karachevsky. I'm just very proud right now. Thank you very much. Fred Coe had a meeting with Patty, and Patty said, I want to do a show. I want to write a script about a guy who's ugly and can't find a girl and it's his problem. You hear this in a discussion today? And Fred would say, Patty, that sounds good. Bring me a script. 
he got to looking at the signs around the ballroom at the Abbey Hotel, which at night was a Lonely Hearts Club. And one of the signs specifically said, Girls, dance with the man who asks you. Remember, men have feelings too. And he became quite intrigued with that, and he came up to me at a break in rehearsal and said, I think I want to write a show about a place like this, about a girl who comes to a place like this. And I sort of gave him the brush and said, uh, Fine, Patty, that's a great idea. And at the next break in the rehearsal, he came up to me again. He said, You know, I've changed my mind. I want to write about a man who comes to a place like this. And I said, Patty, that's a hell of an idea. Go do it. He picked up the phone and called Patty at home and said, uh, Pappy, how are you coming with that Lonely Hearts story? At that time, Patty had, had called it uh, Love Story. That was its title. Uh, Patty said, Well, I've got the first act written. I'm working on the second act, and I've got the third act blocked in my mind so I know where it's going. Fred said, how soon can I have it? Patty said, well, give me a couple of weeks. Fred said, how about Thursday? Literal story. And Patty said, well, I'll finish up the second act tomorrow. I'll get on the third as quick as I can, and uh, I'll get it to you as soon as I can. So we set forth casting calls, cast Rod Steiger with the first act in hand. He accepted the part on the basis of that. We cast Nancy Marchand with the second act in hand, because that's the only act in which she appeared. Well, there you are again. I'm this weird-looking creature. And uh, they, they let me play that part, because I was a weird-looking creature. I was the dog. I didn't mind. I loved it. We went into rehearsal on Saturday with two acts in hand and the rest of the cast set. We didn't know what the third act was going to wind up being. I believe, and I think Patty believed, that we had the best of all possible worlds. We were fortunate in our casting, in the script for Marty. Rod and Nan were, were just glorious, and the shorter script. And the more overt emotionalism that was present in that script worked best for that small audience seeing a small screen I remember seeing Marty on television on a night when my wife was in the hospital and I was alone in the apartment and we had an old television set and I sat there with a round screen that I could watch. Do you remember round screens? And I sat there watching this show and I began to cry and I realized he was doing something incredible. and. I called him up half an hour after the show was over and I said, you son of a bitch, you just made me break down and cry. Why did you do that? He said, what do you mean I broke? I said, Patty, you are one hell of a writer. That, that show is fabulous. And he said, did you really like it? He was stunned that I'd called him. I said, Patty, it was beautiful. And I knew he'd been writing about himself. I mean, that's Everybody knows that Patty was always digging it out of himself. I mean, there were spectacular writers. I mean, I, th I think Patty Chayefsky, just stone cold, saw the future 20 years off twice and wrote great people saying, saying it. It was the first, first time for a major television show to be done on screen. Harold Hecht wanted a show that would have the emotional impact that the television show did. It would be twice as long. Uh, the original show was about 48 minutes long, filling an hour slot, and uh, this one would be about 90. Uh, he wanted the same impact, but he did not want the audience to perceive this as being just a remake of the television show. Same cast, uh, same director, same scriptwriter, but a slightly longer script. He wanted as much change as possible. Harold, without denying us, kept trying to suggest other people. Out of that came Ernie Borgnine, whom I had worked with many times in Philco before he came out to Hollywood and became famous as Fatso Judson in From Here to Eternity. Patty and I went up by a small plane, which Harold chartered for us. Uh, he had been sent a script, came off the set late in the afternoon, came in sweaty and dirty and with a stubble of beard, and we sat in his little motel room. Patty lay down on the bed, and I read the two or three scenes with Ernie. And we got to the part where he says, why don't you put on the blue suit or the gray suit and go down? There's a lot of tomatoes, you know, and, that, and I turned to him and I said, Mom, don't you understand? I'm just a, an ugly, ugly man. And I 
started to cry because I was that much into it, you know. And I turned away, and, and I came back for my retort. You know, I said, all right, I'll put on my blue suit. And, but, uh, you know, and I saw him crying. And I looked at Delbert, and he was crying. And inwardly, I said, God, I've got the part. <laughs> if you ask me to epitomize why early television like that was so important, it was important because... He could be writing that, and Rod Serling could be doing Requiem for a Heavyweight or, or whatever shows. People were experimenting and trying and looking. Uh, what was the thing about uh, the days of Wine and Roses? We were, we were tackling very important themes. Patty Chayefsky, what a darling man. Patty was the best. He learned better than anybody, Chayefsky. Patty Chayefsky, C-H-A-Y-E-F-S-K-Y. Delbert Mann. Uh, Delbert was the kind of person, I met him through another director. Uh, I've forgotten that wonderful director's name. Uh, it's in my book, but he was a wonderful director, and, uh, and he told... Delbert Mann about me. So Delbert called me in, you know, and, and said, I'd like you to, you know, we're going to work together. And so, fine, sir. And I suddenly found uh, a teacher. This man came from North Carolina, and he was part of my most wonderful group of people uh, and writers, uh, and directors and stuff. But Delbert Mann was... Uh, was a teacher, I, and, and, and without without really, uh, what was I saying? What, what I, how could I put it? Without really mentioning it, he was teaching you at the same time that he was directing you. And you never felt it. You never felt that he was teaching. It was just like, I always told him, I said, you know, I, I just did something here that I, I, I could never have imagined in my mind, thanks to you. And he said, well, thank you very much. I appreciate that, you know. And and we went on to do a number of things together. And I, I remember um, when we when we did Marty together as a motion picture, uh, I said, well, here we are back again, except that we're now we're make, get, we got the big screen. He said, yep. And it was his very first picture. It all happened. I was making a picture called Vera Cruz down in Mexico with... Uh, Gary Cooper and Burt Lancaster and all. And uh, Delbert came down to get a few ideas of how to shoot outside because he had always been used to a studio and uh, he wanted to get some kind of clue as to what to do outside and everything else. And So he had Bob Aldrich as his teacher. And Bob Aldrich said, you're going to do this picture. He said, would you mind very much if I... Uh, if I uh, uh, look at the script. Uh, Marty said, no, not at all. So he read the script, and a couple of weeks later at a party, uh, he was asked, who in your mind could play this role of Marty? And he said, uh, I know of nobody else, he said, but Ernest Borgnine. Are you kidding? He said, this guy's a killer. He just goes around killing people. That, that's all he does in his pictures, you know. He stabs them to death and do the... No, I said, don't kid yourself. He said, this guy could do it. So they said, okay, we'll take a chance. So they called me in, and they said, uh, we've got a part for you in a picture called Marty. I said, fine, that's wonderful. I'd be very glad to play any part. He said, you don't understand this. He said, we want you to play the role of Marty himself. And I, I looked at him, and I said, do you have faith in me? He said, well, I wouldn't ask you if I didn't. I said, then I'll give you 120%. Thank you very much. I said, okay. So now you, when, when you're making this picture, I left to go right up to uh, Lone Pine, California, where we were making then Bad Day at Black Rock with Spencer Tracy. And uh, <laughs> uh, they said, Delbert Mann and Patty Chayefsky are going to come up and have you read for them. Okay, fine. You know, you read. Good. Well, make a long story short, I was leaving the the, the uh, cast of uh, Bad Day at Black Rock one day, 
And Spencer looked at me and he said, hey, where are you going? He said, if anybody leaves here early, it says me, I'm the star here. <laughs> he was kidding, of course. And I told him, I said, I had to go down and read. Read? He said, you don't read anymore. He says, you're a star. I said, out of your mouth to God's ears. <laughs> What's it all about? Well, I told him the story, and he said, gee, it sounds pretty good. By golly, that's all right. Oh, don't worry about it. He said, you go on. You, you, you'll get it. Don't worry about it. Well, I went down, and I walked in, and I had a cowboy hat on, and a three-day growth of beard and pants, boots. And Patty was sitting along. They'd just come up in an airplane, a little plane bouncing all over these mountains, you know, going up to Lone Pine. And they were kind of a little sick, you know, and Delbert was stretched across my bed. And uh, I looked at this man sitting in the chair. I'd never seen him before, and it was Patty Chayefsky. And he looked at me, and you could just see in his eyes, say, this is Marty? <laughs> <laughs> it couldn't be, you know. Well, make a long story short. Hi, fellas. How are you? Hello, hello. Good to see you. Delbert, wonderful to see you, sir. All right. And I went in and kind of washed up a little bit, you know. And, and uh, so I said, well, get, get ready to stay. I said, well, you know, Ernie, he said, uh, we've been talking. He said, uh, uh, we feel that. And he got to the word but on his excuse. I said, sir, I said, believe me. If you feel that I'm not right for the part, you know, I'll help you find somebody. Because I said, I feel quite strongly about this. I feel that, you know, it, it, this could be a heck of a great motion picture. So they looked at each other and they said, okay, come on. Well, we started reading. And instantly I forgot that my first six lessons in acting that I had learned at way, way back in... <laughs> at the Randall School of Dramatic Arts. And and uh, he said, wait a minute, wait a minute. He says, you, you're doing this with a Western twang. I said, oh, God, <laughs> forgive me, you know. So I went over and threw my hat down, rolled, took my boots off, and, and rolled up my sleeves and everything else. And I said, okay, let's get going. Let's start. So we started out. Now, Patty's reading all the other part, my mother and everything else, and I'm reading Marty. And we got to the part where he says, why don't you put on the blue suit or the gray suit and go down, there's a lot of tomatoes, you know, and, that. and I turned to him and I said, Mom, don't you understand? I'm just a, an ugly, ugly man. And I started to cry because I was that much into it, you know, and I turned away and, and I came back for my retort, you know. I said, "All right, I'll put on my blue suit." And, but uh, you know, and I saw him crying, and I looked at Delbert, and he was crying. And inwardly, I said, "God, I've got the part." <laughs> <laughs> it was the best performance of my life that day, to try to prove to those two men that I could do it. Mm. I went back the next morning. Spencer looked at me, and he said, "Huh? I, said, I got the part, sir." I got it. Oh, boy. Great, great. That's wonderful. The next year, I beat him out for an Academy Award. I had gone, uh, I'd gone to practice that day. You know, they had, uh, they always have practice, uh, the practice. Uh, uh, they go up there and, and, and you're going to arrive at this moment, you're arriving at that moment, you're doing this, you're doing that. And would you mind coming up and then accepting it this way? Maybe if, if you win. Okay, fine. So uh, I've been there, and Jerry Lewis said to me, he says, you know, you're going to win this thing. I said, no, nah, I said, are you kidding? He said, I bet, I bet you a buck 98. <laughs> Working with Jerry, it was fun, you know. So I said, I got you. You've got to bet. So I went home and I took a red sock of my little daughter's red sock and filled it up with 198 pennies. <laughs> I put it in my pocket just for the kicks, you know. Well, I was looking out over the, the audience as Grace Kelly had called out my name. And I had been looking out over the audience saying, Jesus, nice, nice people, you know. And my wife is going, they called your name. They called your name. I said, what, what? Oh, 
Oh, oh, I had no idea I was ever going to win, really. I had nothing to say. I had no so I went up there, and, I, and suddenly I remembered the Red Sox, and Jerry Lewis was at the thing there to help me up on the stage, you know. And I handed him the Red Sox. <laughs> I said, okay, you win. And I walked up and got my Oscar. And it was the funniest thing ever, you know, because he said, I kept the pennies and spent the sock. <laughs> I suddenly had a, a, a publicity man, a general manager, a, a manager, a, a personal manager. I had a, 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 an accountant. Uh, I had an old, I had an old Cadillac that was, um, I, I just bought an old Cadillac secondhand, you know. I had to get rid of it. Oh, got to get rid of the Cadillac. Well, what, what, you got? this is a perfectly good car. No, 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 you got to get a new one. Well, the new one I got, and the rainstorm, the front windshield fell out. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, suddenly everything changed, including my then wife, bless her heart. We'd been through everything, you know. And when I won the award, she put on a dark glasses, and suddenly it was Mrs. Borgnine has to go to the, you know, the, the the hairdressers. Mrs. Borgnine is coming, and you know it was one of those things, and it got to the point where uh, you just, I don't know, it it, it 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 was a good thing, and I still revere it. I still think it's wonderful. It's a it's something that my peers gave me uh, for my work, and I'll never forget that. I also have, over on the side there, the British Film Academy Award, uh, which was given to me at the same time. I have the, the Golden Globe. I have uh, any number of things, you know. But uh, still, uh, there's that thing of saying, well, could it have been nicer? Could it have been... I don't know, something or other that uh, I, I didn't want fanfare. I, didn't, I don't like fanfare that much. But I think that um, uh, the life didn't become any better. It became a little bit more uh, people were trying to take advantage of you, too. Uh, they put me under contract, and it cost me a half a million dollars to get out of that contract, finally. Mm -hmm. But it was it was terrible, and... Uh, uh, well, you know, that's the vagaries of winning and losing. I do remember uh, when we finished this, uh, the, the scene, and um, as I was walking off, Dean Martin came on and said to the audience, you see, now there's an actor. <laughs> <laughs> I never forgot that. Coming from his mouth, his lips, mm -hmm. it, it, it hit me in, in such a way, you know, and I loved him so much. He was just a most wonderful man, like Frank Sinatra. Just two great, wonderful people. They were real. You know, a lot of people used to say bad things about him. Oh, he's a drunk. Or, you know, he likes to fight and everything. No such thing. You know what, you know what Frank Sinatra did one time? Remember Lee J. Cobb, the actor? He was laying in a hospital with a you know, heart attack and everything else. One day the ambulance backed up and they put Lee J. Cobb in the ambulance. Where are you taking me? He said, oh, that's all right. Don't worry about it. Well, i got to pay. No worry about it. That's taken care of. They took him out to Palm Springs and put him in the compound over there with Frank Sinatra. And Frank finally showed up and Lee J. Cobb looked at him and he said, but, sir, why? why? Why do you do this? He said, I like the way you act. Thank you. Thank you. You'll be glad to hear I'm not going to ask you to go on the treadmill today. Oh, well, I could, but, um, you know, I've we got one at home. And do you use it much? I look at it a lot. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it's absolutely fabulous that the National Film Theatre is giving you this retrospective. Isn't that wonderful? Do you find it very flattering? I think it's marvelous. You know, um, uh, I don't like to brag, but I did win the F British Film Academy Award as well, the time that I won the Oscar. And um, to me, it's one of the, the great pleasures of life, you know, to know that 
you're liked in foreign countries as well. And, uh, and now here they are honoring me again. And I, I think it's just wonderful. When you were starting off in your career, did you want that recognition, that fame, the, I'm not say notoriety, you know, but people knowing who you are? I, I think just like anyone else, you know, you like a little fame, a little notoriety. I remember standing outside of a cafeteria one time where I, I was all alone in Hollywood making my very first picture. And I came out and I looked up Hollywood and Vine and I said, I wonder if anyone in this world will ever recognize me. Well, I can't go anywhere without being recognized. It's wonderful. And um, I'll, I'll never forget, uh, just uh, this, this, uh, this year, as a matter of fact, I was on a ship that uh, stopped at Pitcairn Island. And uh, these people came out from the island, and they were displaying their wares on the ship. And uh, I went down to take a look and look around, and Mr. Borgnine! What are you doing here? <laughs> well, you know. It's fabulous, though, isn't it? Yeah, it As you is. say, in, in all parts of the world. Yeah. And, of course, you come to London quite a bit because your gorgeous wife comes to present on QVC a lot. That's right. And uh, I hope to be uh, present with her uh, this time when she's on QVC. I tell you, we're going into, uh, well, we're 28 years married now, going into our 29th. And I tell you, it's just been a joy. It has, because... Um, uh, uh, unashamedly, I've been married uh, five times, but I didn't get married to get divorced, believe me. But things But you happen. went into each one... You know, like I was yes, married one time to Ethel Merman. I know you were. And it was a lovely, lovely lady. While we were going together, we were together, and uh, about, after about a year, we said, let's get married. Fine. And we went on a honeymoon to uh, Kyoto and Tokyo and all that. And the times just kept getting worse and worse. And I kept saying to myself, why, why? Well, I suddenly realized, although she was a great Broadway star, nobody there around the world knew her. They all knew me, but they didn't know her. And she didn't like that very much. Not very much. So that only lasted 32 days. What, your marriage? Uh-huh. <laughs> Boy, I tell you what, I love a man who makes his mind up fast. Well, listen, it's either that or get, you know. <laughs> 32 days. Anyway, you hit it very lucky this time. And I smell divine because I'm wearing Toby's perfume. Isn't so there that you go. some beautiful yes, perfume? Yes, absolutely gorgeous. It's marvelous. Yeah. Now, listen, you've been in the saddle yet again in a Western. You bet. So and I was just the happiest guy in the world. Uh, I had people coming all over from, from Germany and everything else to take pictures of me getting back on a horse. <laughs> And, you know, it had been 32 or 33 years that I'd oh, been on a horse. Uh, I always found that the best way to get their attention is to use a crowbar or something. <laughs> no, no, I'm honest, I'm only kidding. <laughs> I wouldn't hurt an animal for nothing. But um, I said, okay, you want to see me get on a horse? They said, yes. I said, fine. So I said, bring me my stepladder. <laughs> got up on a stepladder, got on to a horse. To get on a horse? Sure. <laughs> Why was... not? Where were you filming? We were filming uh, in and around uh, Los Angeles. Yeah. Fantastic. It was a wonderful little story called uh, The Long Ride Home. And uh, it'll be out shortly, and I'm sure you'll all be seeing it here in, uh, in England. And I hope you'll enjoy it. I always think that for those of you great, sort of, because there are quite a number of great Hollywood movie stars who took part in a lot of westerns and a lot of army films, it's a bit like Boy's Own Adventure, isn't it? Oh, dear Lord, yes. You know, I spent ten years in the Navy. Uh, and I, I spent six years before the war, uh, World War II, and then uh, f uh, four years during the war. And I tell you, it was a, a, a wonderful experience, and, and yet... I wouldn't have anything to do after the war was over. I said, that's it, I'm going home. I hear your mom had something to say. Yeah, and, and after a couple of weeks, I was home, you know, and my mother looked at me, she said, well, it was kind of one of those wells, you know, you get a job or else. <laughs> <laughs> well, make a long story short, I'd go out and I'd look in, at these factories and, and I'd see these young old men walking into these factories and I'd say, me, after 10 years in the service, get into those jails? I just couldn't see it. So one day I went home and my mother looked at me and she said, what's the matter, Ernie? And I said, Mom, for two cents I go back in the service again because I said, I, I, I can't. She said, have you ever thought of becoming an actor? Says so you always like to make a damn fool of yourself in front of people. Why don't you give it a try? Do it for money. <laughs> 
And I tell you, it was like open sesame. I saw that, I saw that light and I said, Mom, that's when I'm going to be an actor. And ten years later, I had an Academy Award, but don't ask me what happened in between. <laughs> but obviously acting, I mean, it always appeared to me to come very easily to you, because as you say, you hadn't planned to be an actor for years and years. No. I don't, uh, as far as I remember, you didn't train in drama school that long. No. So it was kind of a natural instinct. I, I, went, to, I went to drama school. I tried to get into Yale, but uh, Yale meant two years of undergraduate study, and I finally found a little gr drama school that I where I learned that the Greeks did have an outdoor theater. <laughs> that was <about> it. <laughs> and, then, and finally I went to this place called the Barter Theater of Virginia, where I really learned my profession, starting from the bottom up, working and, and, and um, making sets and building sets and, and uh, lighting and uh, everything that you could possibly imagine before becoming an actor, and, um, but watching. You know? Well, when I looked through your filmography earlier on today, I was laughing to myself. It is just page <laughs> after page after page. So we've had great difficulty deciding just what we would centre on. <laughs> and clearly we have to centre on From Here to Eternity. So let's just talk first of all about that fabulous cast. What a cast of people. Deborah Carr, Frank Sinatra, Bertrand. Ah, I'll Langston. never forget the very first, very first morning uh, we were shooting that I was in the, in the scene and Frank Sinatra I was doing that dance scene uh, in this uh, place and Montgomery Clift was there and, and uh, Burt Lancaster had come by and Deborah Carr and everyone was there and there I was wide-eyed and and, 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 and and you know just dying and okay we're gonna do this and I'm playing the piano and uh, Frank Sinatra looks up and he says come on fatso he said you know we're, uh, uh, we're gonna, you know, we're trying to dance here. And I stood up and I said, "Well, you little wop." <laughs> and he looked up at me and he said, "My God, he's ten feet tall." <laughs> <laughs> Broke the ice. From then on, it was nothing. It was a cinch. Well, now to be analytical about this particular clip, I mean, it does really show that very sharp edge that you managed to develop yeah. in this film. Yeah. Do you have a reason for that? Do you know where that came from? You mean the reason because? Uh, where well, I said... Well, no, just in terms of character, you know, because oh, it's a very sharp edge that you show. Uh, I said to myself, you know, I have to be the meanest man in the world to do that part. I said, either that or go back or go to selling children's clothes or something, because I said, there's no sense in just, you know, being nothing. And so I became a bad man. And for a long time, I did nothing but stick pitchforks in Lee Marvin or do something, you know, and bam, bam, bam. And I was a bad guy. And suddenly this little part of Marty came along and they, they said, um, who could we get to play this thing? And Rod Steiger had done it on TV, but he was busy doing um, Oklahoma at the time. And so I was recommended. And they said, but he's a killer. You know, how can he play that part? I said, no, no, he can do it. And uh, that was my good friend Robert Aldrich, who uh, was a great director. And um, so the part came along, and, and I did it. <laughs> well, you know, the kind of writing that Patty Chayefsky did was so beautiful. And you became that character. At least I told him many times, I said, you know, you wrote me. And he said, I think I did. <laughs> but um, I just played myself because of the fact that I had been a wallflower for many years. I can't believe it. I was it. afraid to approach a woman, you know, to go out and dance. I didn't know how to dance. I didn't know anything. But uh, suddenly when I got the opportunity to say, hey, I'm going to be an actor, and I blossomed out, I became... Not a wallflower anymore. I had, I had letters, believe it or not, from people after they saw this picture. They said, thank you for taking us off the wall, you know? And uh, so I had a, I've always had a ball uh, playing bad people. Or, and, and I remember Luella Parsons, who was a great columnist at one time in, in uh, Los Angeles, as you probably remember. And uh, Luella Parsons said, Borgnine to play Marty? Impossible. He's a killer. <laughs> <You know? laughs> But uh, uh, it happens, and uh, I think that if you're an actor worth your salt and, and can do these things, more power to you. And, Absolutely. Um, and that's uh, why they're giving you a retrospective 
at the National Film Theatre next week. Well, I tell you, I'm so thrilled. I'm, I really am. And, and, of course, to be back here in England. And to I be able to England. go shopping. Oh, Harrods. <laughs> <laughs> I have to tell you that Ernest is staying about five minutes away so that he could just get there fast. Exactly. I can't even begin to tell you uh, what a pleasure it is to meet you. And Thank you, I'm dear. so pleased you came to see us. It's and, been my pleasure. And any time you're back on that QVC or whatever, come and see us again. I certainly will. And send your wife sometime too. <laughs>
Ernie's vast range of acting talents got him many memorable parts in scores of successful Hollywood film and television shows. Off camera, Ernie's been the voice of a number of animated characters. You're in the wrong seat. Move it. Ah. Even at age 94, Ernie's still busy. Frank Moses file. Frank Moses was one of the most effective black op agents we've ever had. He retired drug lords, terrorists. Hell, he toppled governments. Eh, they don't make them like that anymore. And they don't make them like Ernest Borgnine, a true living legend. Ladies and gentlemen, co-starring in red, please welcome Morgan Freeman. Can't see the teleprompter with all of you standing up. <laughs> now, as you know, Ernie is a practicing Italian, and his people have a way with words. In fact, there's an Italian expression that captures the essence of this celebration. La vita è quello che tu ne fai. Life is what you make it. How proud we are, Ernest that you chose for his seven remarkable decades to make your life the life of an actor. And how very honored we all are to present you with this year's Screen Actors Guild Award for Life Achievement. Thank you, my friend. My great pleasure. And thank you, Tim. Yes, it all started with a question. Have you ever thought of becoming an actor? When I came home from World War II, my mother asked me, have you ever thought of becoming an actor? You always wanted to be a, an adlequino, a clown in front of people. Well, I went ahead and became an actor. It's a long other story, of course, but I want to say one last thing about us. There are millions of those in, in the world who would love to be in our shoes. We are a privileged few who have been chosen to work in this field of entertainment. There were members of our group who will be long remembered for their work and whom we still enjoy today. I hope that we will never let our dedication to our craft fail, that we will always give the best we possibly can to our profession so that people may enjoy us in later years. On behalf of my family, my wife Tova, our love, our thanks, and our best wishes for your high success always. Thank you so very much for this great honor. Thank you. Turn Justin Timberlake, Susan Sarandon, Jeff Bridges, and Hillary Swank with a special in memoriam tribute. <laughs> <laughs>